والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة فقال أنبئوني بأسماء هؤلاء إن كنتم صادقين رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد I didn't do that, I promise. <laughs> that wasn't me. I think it's not working. I'll take that. That's, that's even better. I was worried that I have to stay in one place. Okay, is this better? Okay. But I can walk around now too, so this is better. Alhamdulillah. Everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So it says on the program that this is going to be an academic lecture. That's a lie. Uh, I am not an academic, so I don't know how to do that. So, um, but this is going to be hopefully a conversation that is of interest to you, inshallah. The subject matter is pretty much as wide open as possible, Islam, a way of life, which means I can say whatever I want and it still counts as Islam, a way of life. But uh, I, am, I do want to share some specific things with you given the context of, inshallah, university. A lot of you are students, show of hands, students at the university. Okay, quite a few, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, and this is a university and others in the area that are focused on the sciences. So I did want to give my talk today uh, about the Quran focused on some aspects of the relationship between our religion and modern developments. So what I want to start with inshallah ta'ala is Europe. Uh, and I, a lot of you are familiar with European history but I'll take bits and pieces of European history and give you the summarized version just so we can carry our conversation forward. In Europe, of course, for many, many centuries, the church was in complete control. And when the church was in complete control, uh, the state mandated Christianity as the official doctrine, official religion. So if you believe in a version of Christianity other than the church version, then you are basically, in our language, you're a murtad, and you're a wajib al-qatl. Okay, you're out of the official religion and you must be killed, okay? Of course, any books, any literature that contradicts religion must be destroyed. So Europeans, uh, if they were to develop literature in science, for example, the biblical belief was that the universe is, you know, the earth is at the center of the universe. The earth is at the center. But of course, with a little bit of development in science, we know that it's not at the center of the universe. The universe is much bigger and we're just a little tiny speck. Well, this idea seems to contradict the Bible, so instead of rethinking about the Bible, we must burn all of these books and anybody who talks about science and all of it. People who talk about philosophy must be ex you know, either killed or expelled from the land. By the way, interestingly enough, a lot of these people, a lot of these Europeans who could not express their ideas and who could not explore their sciences, in Europe, because of church policy, they moved to Muslim lands. They moved to Muslim lands. And as a matter of fact, a lot of what was burnt and destroyed in the European languages was recovered in Arabic and then brought back eventually to Europe. So this is just a brief account of some of that history, but I do want to tell you, of course, eventually from the 1700s onwards, there is an uprising in Europe and the church is finally toppled. And now you have the development of what we call secularism, right? And, but we have to understand secularism first. Usually when the Muslims hear the word secularism, we get very offended or scared, or think this is a device of the shaitan or something. Right? But we have to understand the history of it first, a little bit at least, to understand where these people are coming from. Well, the church stopped people from thinking critically. You cannot think for yourself. The church will think for you, the pope will think for you. And any thoughts you have that contradict, if you even start asking questions, you should be killed. There's no room for this. We have to have complete submission to the religion. That's what we must have. As a reaction to that in Europe, when finally the church is overthrown, they want to make sure that the church never gains power again. Because it's too extreme, it forces you to believe things that even if they don't make sense to you, you have to accept them also. And even if you don't accept them openly, you have to keep your mouth shut about it. We can't have this again. So we cannot allow them to have power again. But actually it wasn't just the church. The policy became if our religion, if Christianity at that time was so extreme, then it must be that if you give power to any religion, then they're going to do the same thing. 
they're going to stop any freedom of speech, any freedom of thought, any critical thinking, any asking of questions, so we cannot have religion in a position of power because it will oppress humanity. So we must separate, we can't get rid of religion, but we must separate religion and all of the rest of life. Governance, policy, education, anything that affects the public should be free from religion. Anything that affects the public. If it's education, there should not be any mention of religion in public education. Because that will again create the same problem that we used to have. If it's government policy, it should have nothing to do with religion. Because that will create oppression. One religious group will offend and oppress another religious group. We can't have that anymore. So we're going to have to be, so if, if, if God or religion is not the authority, then the only authority left is ourselves. Right? If, if Allah is not the authority, and if to them, God or Jesus, whoever, is not the authority, then the only authority left is ourselves. And then, you know, in that sense, democracy makes total sense. Because then we can get together and decide what is right and what is wrong. We should be able to do that ourselves. And that's the beginnings of this new age society where religion is re limited, it's not destroyed, it's limited to your personal life. Religion is your personal matter. It has nothing to do with the public. Okay? Now Europe has been, it's been a few hundred years now. It's been a couple of hundred years. But the idea of secularism spread all over the world in one way or another. It didn't just spread as forms of government. People think of secularism as a secular government. But secularism spread in other ways. It spread into the minds of people through education, culture. You know, companies have secular mindsets. So for example, you can work in an organization. Uh, ironically, I was uh, talking to somebody who works in the Khalij. And they work at an American company in the Khalij. And this American company has their own compound. So once you walk in through the gate, you're basically in America. Okay, outside of it, you're in the Khalij. You can hear the Adhan, Al-Kul Yatahadath Bil Arabiya, everything's different. But once you walk in, you're in the US of A. And inside this company, if you are making Salat, they'll tell you, could you please go in the side and pray? People get uncomfortable when you pray in front of them. And if somebody's talking about Deen, and saying, hey, SubhanAllah, I was reading this, ayah. excuse me, we don't talk about religion here. This is the workplace. We don't want to discuss religion in the workplace. So, in what you would think is a Muslim society, they've even carved out a space, and inside that space, religion does not belong in even a public conversation between two work offices, two desks. Keep it to your desk. You know, just keep it there. SubhanAllah. You, and ironically, I've met many Muslims from, I mean, I thought this was a problem in the United States or this was a problem in England, or a problem in Australia. But I met Muslims from different parts of the Muslim world, including here, that would come to me and say, you know, my office, they have a Christmas party. And I don't want to go. How do I explain that to my boss? How do I explain that I don't want to go to the New Year's party to my boss? I said, wait, that's an American problem. That's an Australian problem. How is this a Saudi problem? How is this a Dubai problem? How is this a Qatari problem? How is this a Malaysian problem? When did that happen? You know, I'm used to hearing this in New York City. I'm used to hearing this in Los Angeles. Why am I hearing this somewhere else? So secularism has spread in different ways. And in the minds of many people, religion is best served if you keep it to who? Yourself. Just keep it to yourself. It's a personal matter. And I, I, I wanted to start with that because of course we're saying Islam, a way of life. Right? But a way in, in, a new, in the new world, Islam, a way of personal life. Just personal life. Don't bring it anywhere else. Right? And of course, this is not a war against Islam. This is actually an idea that all, all religions have problems. That's probably my stomach. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, but all religions are problematic when they get to that point. If you bring them into the public, oppression will happen, craziness will happen, extremism will happen. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to bring to your attention. But the next thing I want to bring to your attention is the result of secularism. I've given this talk in different places in different ways, but I'll, I'll summarize it here quickly for you. When you remove religion from the picture, then three or maybe four changes happen in the minds of people. Four changes happen. The most important focus in a religious society is Allah. 
In a religious society, the focus, the primary focus is Allah. Every event begins with the dhikr of Allah. Every gathering has the dhikr of Allah. Every few hours you hear the adhan. You know, Allah is at the center of that society. When you become a secular society, Allah is removed from that picture. And when he's removed from that picture, the focus has to go to somewhere else. Well, where does it go? It goes to the next biggest thing, the universe. In other words, all of your attention used to be on God. Well, you can't see God, but at least you can see what? The universe. So let's just explore and study the universe. Science becomes far more important than religion. Science becomes number one, and religion is somewhere down there. In a religious society, what's the highest knowledge? Religion. The alim, the faqih, the mufassir, you know, the imam. These are people of very noble position because they're studying the highest of all sciences. Actually, in Islamic studies, we call them ulum aliya, high sciences, high knowledge. The Quran is high knowledge. But in a secular society, they ask the question, what are you going to invent if you study Quran? What are you going to discover when you study hadith? I mean, you're going to feel good about yourself and maybe you'll pray or something, but we need to make better hospitals. We need better road systems. We need better infrastructure. We need better, you know. And that's not going to happen until you study what? Science. So the focus becomes what? Science. Now, I'm not criticizing science. We'll, tie, we'll balance the equation at the end. Bear, bear with me. So God is replaced by what? Science, the study of the universe. Before, in a religious society, the most important matter is your heart. إِلَّا مَنَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ The taqwa, you know, فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ The most important thing is our hearts. So the reminder, spirituality, you know, closeness to Allah, dhikr, khushur. These are things that we talk about all the time. The worst thing that could happen is what happened to Banu Israel. ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ Your hearts became hard. The worst thing that could happen is قَسْوَةُ الْقَلْبِ يَا مُقَلِّبَ الْقُلُوبِ ثَبِّتْ قَلْبِي عَلَى دِينِكْ make, your, make my deen firm. Make my heart firm on your deen. The heart and spirituality is the most important thing. But in a secular society, they're not even sure if there is such a thing as spirituality. What is this spirituality? Iman goes up and down. Where does it go up and down? We did a scan of your body and we didn't see any Iman going up and down. And you say your heart becomes soft and your heart becomes hard, but I did a heart surgery and it's still squishy like this. Nobody's heart became, you know, Allah says, Fahiyak al hijara, it turned like a rock. Why did, even the guy who's, you know, the most, you know, irreligious person has no Iman at all. His heart is still what? It's soft. I don't see where the spirituality comes from. What kind of scan do I have to do of your brain or of your heart to find this Iman? You can't see it. So why are we focused on God who we can't see? Let's replace Him with science. Why are we focused on the heart? Which we can't, this spiritual thing, we can't see it. This Iman, we can't see it. Let's focus on something we can observe. So let's replace spirituality with psychology. Okay? The, and, 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 and actually the physical body. So spirituality gets replaced with psychology and medicine, actually. If you can't improve this unseen thing, this ruh, nobody's, seen, no, nobody's ever seen the ruh. Nobody ever seen what, what he means by this, this, this iman inside of you, or this nur inside of you. Forget that. We should just replace that with the observable sciences about the human being. If you want to improve your life, improve your diet, improve your exercise, improve your medical, you know, take the best, best medical procedures if you get sick. And if you're having problems like depression, sadness, anger, which used to be spiritual problems. Now we don't call them spiritual problems. What do we call them? Psychological problems. So the solutions will not come from a spiritual source. The solution will come from a psychological source. And now, nowadays in biopsychology, it's even more interesting. If you are feeling really depressed, then there's probably a pill for that. And if you're really angry, there's probably another bit of medication for that. And if you're really at, if you have a lot of unrest, there's a pill for that too. And if you have a big anger problem, there's a pill for that too. Usually all of your emotions are probably some kind of chemical imbalance inside of you. Right? And if you could just give you enough pills, you'll become a zombie and you'll be fine. Okay? I'm not, by the way, insulting the, the science of psychology. I'm a student of psychology myself. You know, and I respect the science, and I really do. But I'm trying to tell you a shift happened from God to the universe. 
from the soul, from the heart, to the body and to psychology, the study of the mind. Now the, the, the next shift that happens. So the first one was God to universe. The second one was body to, or the soul to the body. And the third one that happens is, all these religions, all they talk about is Jannah and Nar. All they talk about is heaven and hell. Do this and you will go to heaven. Do that and you will go to hell. Right? But I want to do something that makes me feel better now. I want to improve my life now. No, no, no. You shouldn't eat that. That's not good for you. Why isn't it good for me? Well, because it's haram. Well, so what if it's haram? What's the problem? If I eat it, I'm, I like it. No, 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 it's not good. It's, you might like it now, but it's bad for you in your akhirah, in your next life. I've, nobody's ever seen the akhirah. Just like nobody's ever seen God. Nobody's ever seen the soul. Nobody's ever seen the day of judgment, and nobody's ever seen heaven, and nobody's ever seen hell. At least nobody came back and told me. You know? So instead of focusing all my attention on making the next world better, why don't we become more practical and focus all of our attention on what? Making this world better. Let's study sociology. Let's study more political science. Let's study more urban development. Let's study, you know, public services. Let's make the world that is this world into it's something so good that you don't have to worry about some imaginary Jannah. Let's turn this place into Jannah. Let's improve this life. Let's improve the standard of living here. Now these three shifts have happened so far, yes? What are those three shifts again? I don't remember. Huh? God to the universe. Soul to the body. And what's the third one? Afterlife to this life. And here's the last one. This is the scariest one to me. This is the scariest one. The last shift that happened was, in a religious society, what is wrong is clear. And what is right is clear. Morality is clear. Permissible, the halal is clear. And the haram is clear. You know why it's clear? Because yubayyunullahu lakum al ayat. Allah clarifies the ayat for you. He makes it clear. Like the Prophet would say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, innal halala bayin wal haram bayin. The permissible and the impermissible are absolutely clear. There's no confusion. But those of you that have ever gone, like I did when I was in college, I went to my first philosophy class. Two days after the class, one thing becomes very unclear. I don't know what's right and wrong anymore. I don't know what's right and I don't know what's wrong. If you remove God from the picture, then, and if you remove Revelation, because Revelation says, this is what's right, and this is what's wrong. Allahu yahkumu baynakum. Allah is the one who makes the verdicts between you. Then I will have my perspective on what is right, and you will have your perspective on what is right, and we're going to disagree. We're going to disagree. So the definition of right and wrong will become not absolute, but it will become relative. And if it becomes relative, maybe today I will win the debate, and maybe tomorrow you will win the debate. So what used to be right yesterday will be wrong today. And what is wrong today will be right tomorrow. And the standards will keep shifting. They won't stay in one place. The standards will keep shifting. To give you an easy example of that, in the United States, in 1978, I believe it was, 71 to 78, the American Psychological Association unanimously declared homosexuality a psychological disorder. Unanimously declared that homosexuality is a psychological disorder. From then until now, which is not a long time, it's not centuries, it's just 35 years. Now we are at a point where in the United States, if somebody's going to become a psychologist or a, th a therapist, then part of their license is to make sure that if someone comes to them and says, I think I have homosexual tendencies, that they are not allowed to say that that might be a problem. They're supposed to say, well, if you feel that way, that must be a good thing. You should do what you feel. You should do what makes you happy. Because over time, what used to be wrong became what? Not only right, it became now like absolutely celebrated. It became, the, the standard shifted, didn't it? And you guys know about the recent law that was passed in the US, right? 
So, you know, usually on medical forms and others, you say single, married. Now they say married to what? <laughs> so, <laughs> but the standard shifts. And you know what's interesting about this last one? Every time they change the standards, they expect the entire world to submit to their new standard. They expect the entire world to submit. And if you don't submit, you are backwards. You're not moving forward with the times. You're the ones that have khalfiya. You people are stuck. They tell the Muslims, you're stuck in the seventh century. I say, Alhamdulillah, we're stuck in the seventh century. You people today, what you're saying is good. Tomorrow, I don't know what else you're going to make halal for yourselves. And every time they do, they discover something new or they do something more, they expect the whole world should follow them. The whole world should follow them. So four things have changed in the world, in a, in a quickly secularizing world. And this is not just an American problem. This is not just a European problem. This is not just a Western problem. Because these ideas, oh, sorry. Okay, just making sure we're... These ideas are not just relegated to the West. They were able to spread these ideas. And now, of course, we live in the world of YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. That's why I'm here. <laughs> this doesn't make sense unless there's social media, unless there's YouTube, unless there's internet access, right? That's the only reason so many of you know who I am, right? But that's the same medium by which those ideas have also spread all over the world. And these conversations about you know, uh, uh, whether or not religion makes sense are not just conversations that are happening in America. They're happening in Saudi They're happening in the Khadij. They're happening in Malaysia. They're happening in Indonesia. They're happening in Pakistan and Bangladesh. They're happening all over the world. They're happening all over the world. This is the world that we live in. Now, what I want to share with you, not just this kind of introduction to what, what secularism means, but I want to help, help myself and all of you understand how sometimes secularism is subconscious. It's subconscious. So, alhamdulillah, we're Muslims. Uh, wait, hold on. Kita orang Islam? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, very good. Okay, so, oh, it's not that good. Saya faham sediki sediki. You know, it's like, uh, I got it, I got, I got this, okay. So anyway, so, so we're Muslims, and we came from Muslim families, alhamdulillah, and we've been around Islam, so many of us, our entire lives, uh, but then it t time came for you to uh, start a career, right? And you thought about, where sh what should I go do for school? Where should I go for school? Uh, and you think about how our parents, may Allah protect them and preserve them and reward them, our parents, when they thought about, I want my son and my daughter to be successful. I want them to be successful. What do they think about when they think about success? Well, if my, my son was a doctor, or if my son was an engineer, or if my son was a lawyer, if my son had a good, prestigious degree, and they were able to accomplish this, this, and this, then that would be pretty good. That'd be pretty successful. I'd be able to say, my son, is an architect. My daughter is a doctor. My daughter has a PhD. Right? In the world today, all over the world, science and a degree in science, a higher degree in science is seen as the highest kind of credibility. Doctors automatically, oh, you're a doctor, oh, wow. I just, you know. Engineers, scientists, they're, it's a prestige. It comes with a lot of prestige. Guess what? What did, the, what did secularization do? The knowledge of God is less important, knowledge of the universe is more important. And now if you have a degree in the knowledge of the universe, which engineering may be, which chemistry may be, which biology may be, which medicine may be, then you have more respect. And if you, have, uh, if you studied hadith for 20 years, eh. You know. If you've been studying tafsir for 50 years, oh, he's one of those sheikh guys, okay. Why are they here? They should be in the masjid. Why are they at the university? You know? So you, we, what we've done is we've separated those two worlds. We've separated those two worlds. And we've given, as a world, not as one society, as a world, we have given prestige to one side. 
and we have figured that if you couldn't do well in, a, in science, and you're not good at medicine, and you're not good at math, you might as well become a alim. You memorize it, you just do tahfidh. Okay, this is what we did all over the world. Now when you do that, what happens? The smartest people that you have in the ummah have no knowledge of deen. I'm not gonna say what happens on the other side. But the smartest people you have in the ummah have no knowledge of deen. And that's a tragedy. Now I'm gonna stop this conversation halfway and share with you something completely unrelated. Completely. And then tie those two things together, inshallah. I was in Australia and a student came to me, a college student, after I did a lecture and he said that I'm studying uh, accounting. And I feel very bad. I said, of course you should feel bad. You're studying accounting. <laughs> That's the most depressing. <laughs> Couldn't you study? Like, anyway. So he says, no, no, no. I love accounting. I'm very good at it. And I, I think I can get a good career in it. I can become a certified professional accountant. I can do an MBA. I can do all these things. But I feel bad because I'm not studying deen. I want to leave my degree of dunya. And I want to get my degree in deen. Because... We should be serving deen and not dunya. Wait, so we separate deen from what? Dunya. So we think in our mind, maybe I'm studying, or maybe I'm serving deen, or maybe I'm serving dunya. But this division is actually only possible if you have accepted secularism. Because to a secularist, religion belongs in one space, and the rest of life belongs in another space. For the Muslims, this was never a problem. This is a new problem for Muslims. That they think if they have a career in engineering, or if they have a career in medicine, or if they have a career in finance, or if they have a career in administration, that somehow they're not serving deen. The alim, the mufti, the hafiz, the imam, the faqih, they're, studying, they're serving deen. We're all just serving dunya. That's incorrect. That's entirely incorrect. And that's what I really wanted to come here and talk to you about. If your intention and if your mindset isn't clear as Muslims of what you're doing in life, then you're, you know, you're, you're already a failure. Forget later on in life, if your mind is not in the right place, you're already a failure. And I don't want anyone here to be a failure. You know, Allah did not give us the honor of Islam to be failures. The fact that we have the honor of Islam means we are meant for success. We are meant for success. Okay? So let me explain one example to you from the Quran. Just one example. Allah says, Ar-Rahman allama al-Qur'an. Very easy, right? Ar-Rahman, he taught the Qur'an. So who's the teacher of the Qur'an in this ayah? Ar-Rahman. Allah is the teacher of the Qur'an. Fine. Keep that in mind. Allah says, وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ He teaches you what you could not have known. He teaches you what you could not have known. We could not have known the Qur'an. We could not have known the five prayers. We could not have known the Kaaba. We could not have known Hajj. We could not have known halal and haram. We could not have known any of these things. Allah teaches you what you could not have known. So it's two ayat now. Allah is doing what? Teaching you. Now, let's let me tell you a story about Medina. In the city of Medina, when the Muhajirun were there and all the Ansar are there, it's a newly formed city. Most people did not know how to read and write. Majority of people were illiterate. Majority of people. But this is a growing economy, isn't it? And in a growing economy, you have to have business contracts, dealings, arrangements, agreements. Not every agreement is sim as simple as going to the store and buying a Kit Kat. You give the three ringgits and you get the over expensive Kit Kat. And it's done. No, no, no. Some, some agreements are contracts where you have to sign that payment will be made in six months. The ha half the merchandise will be delivered now, the other half will be delivered by next year, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's, there's a time duration. And if there's a time, you have to have clear deadlines. And if you don't write them down, then the one guy will say, no, 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 next month. And he'll say, no, 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 you said this month. I don't remember that. And they're going to start fighting each other. The only way you can stop the fighting is what? Writing it down. So Allah says, If you're going to make an agreement among each other of taking loans with each other, then make sure you document it. The problem of documenting in Medina is most people are what? Illiterate. How are they going to document it? They can't document because most of them can't even write. So now they have to find people who know how to what? To write. 
Now tell me about the Prophet ﷺ. Does he know how to write? He doesn't know how to write. So they can't go to the religious authority. And there is no bigger religious authority than the Prophet ﷺ. And they can't go to any of his students because he himself is a Nabi al-Ummi. وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ You didn't read any book before and you don't write it with your hand. You know? So now they have to find a writer. But whoever they find, Allah will say in the ayat, in these ayat, that they should find a katib. A katib is a writer. Allah did not say believer, muttaqi, Muhsin, Sahabi, Muhajir, Ansari. He said the qualification should be, his, his resume should say he knows how to what? Write. And did he learn to write from a religious institution? Did he learn to write from the Prophet ﷺ? Did he learn to write in a madrasa? Did he like, learn, where did he learn to write? From some teacher somewhere. He got a secular education. In learning to what? Write. In learning to write. Now, if you find a writer, I had already told you this, so you can answer me now. Are there a lot of writers in Medina or a few? Very few. So you find one and you say, hey, can you write our contract for us? And he says, I don't want to do it. I don't have time for you. Allah says, Wala ya'ba katibun. No writer should refuse. No writer should refuse. Are you guys familiar with the idea of jury duty? Right? So some, some people have to fulfill a duty that can serve the rest of the community. It's like a fard kifaya kind of thing. So Allah says, if the few people who know how to write, they should take the civic responsibility and they should not refuse if they are called to write a contract. This is their public service. They must do it as citizens of Medina. Okay? But here's the part. This is why I told you this whole story. I told you Allah taught the Quran. Alam al-Quran. I told you, وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ He teaches you what you couldn't know, isn't it? Now he says, listen. He says, وَلَا يَأْبَ كَاتِبٌ أَنْ يَكْتُبَ كَمَا عَلَّمَهُ اللَّهِ فَلْيَكْتُبْ No writer should turn it down based on what Allah taught him. So he should write it down. Wait, the writer, his education, Allah says, who gave him that education? Allah gave him that education. The same Allah who tells me in the Qur'an, He taught the Qur'an. The same Allah who tells me, He taught me the Islam I could never know, is telling me now that the writer who will write the business contract, who has nothing to do with deen, when he learned to write, who was actually teaching him? Allah was teaching him what we call right now secular knowledge. We call it secular knowledge, and Allah is saying that is taught by who? Allah, so that's sacred knowledge. That's sacred knowledge. The knowledge of science, the knowledge of the world, the knowledge of how to write, the knowledge of the business finance, con contractual agreements. You could imagine if, we, if this was happening today, that would be an MBA, that would be a, you know, a finance guy, that would be a business contract specialist, you know, that would be an economics person, it would be an executive in the finance department, it would, might, might even be a financial executive lawyer, this kind of person. And Allah says, his education was provided by who? Allah. Allah glorified his education in this ayah. He glorified his education. And in doing so, he taught us a very powerful lesson. We, any knowledge that human beings learn, any knowledge that human beings learn, is actually a gift from Allah. It is not limited to the study of Quran and Sunnah. It's not limited to the study of fiqh and sharia and tafsir. Engineering is a gift from Allah. Accounting is a gift from Allah. Finance is a gift from Allah. Medicine is a gift from Allah. All of these sciences, we call them the secular sciences. But that's because we have accepted the narrative, the language of Europe. <laughs> Sorry, Europe. Okay. We've accepted the language of you know, the European break the split, and we've accepted it subconsciously. So we say this one's studying deen and this one's studying dunya. It's not the case. Ah, I'll find the place. I, I'll keep moving, I don't know.
did I do to deserve this? Okay. <laughs> Who? Is there a European operator on the... <laughs> okay. That's better. Just lower the volume, it should be okay. Okay. What was I saying? Something about Islam or something? Before the mic had an allergic reaction? Okay, so, so let, me, let me wrap this up. What I'm trying to say to all of you, inshallah, is that first and foremost, the point I'm trying to make is that we, the Muslims, and the next generation of Muslims, especially, we are the response. We are supposed to be the response to the mess that's already been made by the European break. They thought religion is a problem because Christianity was a problem. And instead of blaming Christianity, they blamed all religion. They blamed all religion. And today, the most of the allergies against Islam and most of the reaction against Islam is actually 80% already established by their allergic reactions to Christianity, and then 20% they add a little, you know, the wonderful things some Muslims do on the news. But the, the, the averse thought towards religion is already there. And this generation is supposed to be the one that undoes it. You're part of the solution. How, but you cannot be part of the solution if you don't think clearly. So the last part of my conversation with you, I won't take too long. Uh, the last part of my conversation with you is, how will you think clearly? How are you people supposed to become part of the solution? The fact that I'm here actually is a pretty good indication that we live in a globalized world, yes? And the fact that you're sitting in Perlis over here in this university, don't just think that you are contributors to this place. What you are doing and your lives and the legacy that you have to leave behind is much bigger than one place. You start from home and you make examples for the rest of the world. Think, learn to think big. So this last part of my talk with you is about how I want you guys to think, inshallah. Just some things about th you know, how you should think about your own selves. And I'm gonna give you some steps. Okay, this is going to sound highly unacademic. Okay, I'm warning you ahead of time. Some people, uh, actually before I say that, uh, the, the American Constitution says that human beings are, uh, they have the right to pursue life, they, have, they, they should go for life, liberty, and the... Uh, anyone know? Life, liberty, and the... Uh, if you don't know, I'll tell you, pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So what is the pursuit in their mind? Happiness. Do what makes you happy. Okay. That's a lie. Because you'll never be happy. Has everything you think makes you happy? Doesn't make you happy. You thought the iPhone 6 would make you happy? Look at how depressed you are. <laughs> you thought finishing Assassin's Creed in two days will make you happy? You still have a headache. You think things will make you happy, but as soon as you get them, you say, maybe the next thing will make me happy. And then you get to the next thing, and then that doesn't make you happy. So what I'm saying is the pursuit of happiness is the lowest goal. It's not the highest goal, it's the lowest goal. And it's very easy to accomplish. If there's a student, who has a class at seven in the morning, and he stays in bed and says, I don't feel like going. I'm happy where I am. <laughs> he just successfully accomplished happiness. <laughs> Even if temporarily, he said, oh, I fulfilled the American dream, the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> happiness is what? The lowest goal. Let's take one step above that. Because happiness is not, enough, not worth it. Not worth it, not in this life. That's, there's, happiness will come, but not if you pursue it. Everybody who runs after happiness is depressed. I wish I could be happy. That's all they'll do their whole life, you know? Step two, the pursuit of cool. I don't want to be happy, I want to be cool. I wanna dress cool, I wanna look cool, I wanna talk cool. Because if I'm cool, people will like me. Because if I'm not cool, they, they don't want to hang out with me. They sit over there, I have to sit over here. But if I was cool, I could be with them. The pursuit of cool means you are trying your best to fit in with other people. Some people, their whole life is the pursuit of what? Cool. Just the pursuit of cool. 
if I can just get those people to like me. And for doing that, they will change the way they dress, they'll change the way they talk, they'll change, they'll even watch movies that they don't want to watch because they want to fit in with that crowd, you know? They'll use language that they would never normally use just to fit in. And it's a pretty sad way to live because now you're not living for yourself. You're living for somebody else's standards. And some people, this is not just a teenage problem or a college student problem, even adults. Adults, pursuit of cool, they have a different cool. All their friends bought a house. I'm the only one living in an apartment. I should take a loan and I should also buy a house so I can be with them. So I could say I have a house too. Even if taking a loan is going to ruin my life. Because I have to fit. So there's the pursuit of happiness and then what's there? The pursuit of cool. Then there's another step. One step above that. By the way, if you want to pursue cool, it takes a little more work than happiness. Happiness, you stay sleeping, you're happy. You know, eat a mangosteen and you're done. And then the pursuit of cool, you have to make some effort. Now the step above that, for a lot of people, is actually the pursuit of popularity. I don't just want to be cool, I want to be the coolest. When I drive into campus, everybody looks at my car. Wow. When I go shopping, I make sure I buy the bag with the brand on it, and I walk around like... <laughs> Even if I have fruits inside, I'm going to walk around with an Armani exchange bag so that people... Wow. You don't just want to be cool, you want to be the coolest. You want to be popular. You want to be the loudest. You know, sometimes some of you guys are, you know, young. I'm, I'm pretty old. I was born in 1837. But uh, when you guys are younger, you're sitting, sometimes you're sitting in a restaurant, or you're eating dinner, or you're hanging out with friends, and you'll notice one guy, he laughs louder than everybody else. <laughs> and as soon as he does, he looks around. Did anybody check me out? <laughs> anybody look? He doesn't just want to be cool. He wants to be the coolest. I'll tell you a funny story. One time there was an Islamic lecture. I mean, I don't give very Islamic lectures, as you can tell, but still, I was giving a lecture, and what happened was this one guy walked into the hall, and this guy was the coolest. It's a nighttime lecture, he has sunglasses on. When a guy has sunglasses on at nighttime, he's trying to be the coolest. He had like a couple of buttons undone from the shirt, and he walked in real slow. And he was hoping people would notice, but nobody noticed. <laughs> so he walked out slowly, and he walked back in again. <laughs> that would be the pursuit of what? The coolest. Popularity, fame. By the way, in America, you have celebrities that used to be very famous, and now they're not famous anymore. They used to be top of the charts in their music videos, and they were very up there, and now they have no, nobody knows them. So now they go through depression because they are no longer the coolest. So now what they do is they do some scandal or something stupid or something dirty or they get themselves arrested because if they get themselves arrested, they'll be on the news again, right? And you wonder, why did they do that? Why did this woman shave her head, you know? Or why did this one get arrested and, you know, run his car into a tree or... These people have all the money in the world. They have all the fame, but they, don't want, they no longer have the coolest. And they want the coolest, so they will do the stupidest things to get, back in the, back, get the attention again. So that's your third step. It takes a lot more work to be the coolest. And some people will spend their whole life just doing that. What was the first one? I mean, you college students, call it out. It's not a khutbah, it's, you don't get sins for speaking here. Huh? Happiness? What's above that? Cool. And then now? Okay, okay, here. There's one above that. One above that is the pursuit of prestige, reputation, dignity. Yes, no, 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 I like to sit on the table. <laughs> I, like, I, just, I know it's, it's cool. <laughs> uh, so anyway, anyway, so, so the next pursuit is prestige. In other words, in other words, you don't have much to offer, 
but you like to put your name next to something that everybody likes. Let me give you an example. A student goes to Harvard, reputable school. He's only gone for one semester. Has he accomplished anything yet? No, and maybe he's failing all of his classes. But when he meets someone, he says, by the way, I go to Harvard. <laughs> right? Or somebody who's just got into engineering school, by the way, studying engineering. <laughs> you know, you're talking to someone and they'll tell you, like I was one time, I, I, I was talking to someone and they said, yeah, yeah. And they, they, in the middle of conversation, they pulled out their ID tag and they flipped it over because they work at Google. And they really wanted me to know, because you know when people do that, especially right before they start Salah, like, oh, wait, wait. Because <laughs> they want you, people to come, oh, you work at Google? Yes, yes, how did you know? <laughs> you know, you want to be associated with things that have prestige. You want to be associated with brands that have prestige, universities that have prestige. You want to talk about the people that you know. You know who I met? Look at this picture. <laughs> I am now worth something because who I'm standing next to. I am worth something because of the brand that is next to, my, to me. I am worth something because of the school that I went to, because I have these letters at the end of my name. So some people will pursue life the only thing they're looking after is what? Prestige. Just prestige. You know? It's a very sad life, by the way. Because once you get it, there's nothing else to do. And the only thing you, that ever brings you happiness is, who else do I tell that I go to Harvard? <laughs> and some guy's walking, hey, by the way, I go to Harvard. No, I, leave me alone. <laughs> you know? Somebody's asking you for directions to the airport and you're telling him, I, I went to Harvard. Okay. Did your education teach you how to get to the airport? Can you go to the airport, please? Okay, okay, start over. I, I forgot the list, it's too long. Cool? No, 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 that's not. Happiness? Cool? Coolest? Prestige. Money. The next pursuit is what? Man, there are some people, they don't care about happiness. They don't care if they look cool or the coolest. They don't care about prestige. They're wearing a dirty t-shirt and jeans. They're sitting in their basement, hacking away at their computer because they're developing the next big app that they're going to sell and go public, company's gonna go public. The guy hasn't brushed his teeth in five days. The guy hasn't, you know, he's eating like potato chips and whatever to survive. All he cares about is he's gonna sell this thing and he's gonna make a lot of what? Money, and those people are super focused. Money people are very focused people. They're very focused people. Allah even describes them as He gathers the money and he keeps counting it. There are some people who Allah made to make a lot of money. They're really good at it. And you'll never be able to tell. You'll never be able to, they drive a Prius, or they'll drive like a, they'll drive the oldest proton that can be found on the earth. <laughs> and they own like an oil and gas company and they have, you know, 300, 400 million to their name, but you won't know. You will not know. They're wearing a ripped t-shirt and... I met people like that. All over the world. Because they're focused, they're focused, their focus is what? Money. Money, business. That's what they're gonna do. And that's all they ever think about. They, and, and when they see other people who are running after prestige, or running after, because some people think, once I have money, I can get the car. Once I have money, I can get the house. Once I have money, they think, once I have money, I can make more money. And when I have more money, I can make a lot more money. You know, that's, that's how their mind works. They don't have time for any of this other stuff. Okay, and these are some of the most powerful people in the world, by the way. Financially, these are some of the most powerful people in the world. So now our list is getting higher. And by the way, I don't know where you are. I don't know, you have to decide what you've been thinking about. You have to decide. Now, What's above money? But I can't go above money. You have to start over. You have to help me. Happiness? Cool? Coolest? Prestige? Money. Then the pursuit of number one. Let me tell you what that means, the pursuit of number one. 
I don't just want to be the engineering student. I want to be the best student this university ever had. I want to be the valedictorian. I want to get 100 on every test. I'm not happy that I got a 99. Everybody else in class, when they get a 75, they're like, yes, I passed. When I get a 99, they say, why did I get a 99? I needed to get 100. Why did I get this wrong? And I will go and argue with my professor about that one point, and the professor will look at me like, How, you're so smart. Why are you so stupid? <laughs> Why are you obsessing over one point? Why are you arguing about me over this? Nobody even came close. No, no, no. That's not good enough for me. Because I need to be what? Number one. There are people in this life who whether they go into studies or they go into sports or they go into you know, business or they go into whatever they go into, they cannot be ever be happy until they are what? Number one. And they don't even compare themselves to anybody else. They don't. They stop comparing themselves. They don't say, this one got an 80, at least I got an 85. No, no, no. They compare themselves to perfection. And they know that they're never going to be what? Perfect. They're never going to be perfect. So they're never satisfied. They're never satisfied. They keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Do a study of people like Michael Phelps. You know who Michael Phelps is? The Olympic swimmer? Look at his routine. He's by far, so far ahead of any of the competition. Why is he still pushing himself? Because he's, he wants to beat himself. He's not looking to defeat someone else. He's looking to defeat himself. Olympic athletes are like this. Star students are like this. Some of the world's top researchers are like this. You would think once they made their discovery, once they've invented something, once they've you know, started this organization, now they have all the money in the world. They've made half a billion or a billion dollars. They could just relax now and you'll find those people are never relaxed. They're still pushing and still pushing and still pushing because their goal in life is to be what? Number one. And if they don't have that goal, they will fall into deep depression. Like even if they take, for them, a vacation is torture. For people like that, a vacation is torture. Because for two days when they're sitting there at a beach in Langkawi, they're like, I, 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 I'm not number one. <laughs> this is too relaxing. I don't like it. You understand? They'll still be on their phone doing some work or doing something. They'll be pushing themselves and pushing themselves and pushing themselves. And by the way, now we're getting into the categories of people that change the world. The pursuit of happiness, these people don't change the world. The pursuit of cool, they don't change the world. The pursuit of coolest, they don't change the world. The pursuit of prestige, forget about it. Pursuit of money, they can have some effect in the world. But the pursuit of number one, now we're getting somewhere. These are people that end up changing the way the world looks. You know, because they, they push and they push and they push. The Islamic concept of ihsan. This is the Islamic concept of al ihsan. But this is not enough. Even the pursuit of number one is not enough for some people. There's a level even above that. Because even if you're number one, how long are you going to live? However long Allah decides, and then you're going to die. And then somebody else will be number one, isn't it? You need to do something that lives longer than you. There are people in the world who don't care about money, who even being number one is secondary to them. Even that is not a primary objective. Their primary objective is leaving a legacy. Impact. They are, not, they are not pursuing something for themselves. They live their life in pursuit of impact. So after number one, there is impact. Now, please understand. It doesn't mean that they make impact. It only means that they pursue impact. They don't have to make impact. They have to... Pursue impact. For example, somebody says, I want to fight hunger in the world. I want to make sure nobody in this city, uh, no child in this city is hungry. That's a big goal. It's bigger than myself. It's a much bigger goal than myself. And maybe I'll never achieve it. But I will, I will keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And I'll do something that is far beyond myself. And guess what's going to happen if you're sincere in this? If you're sincere in leaving impact, then Allah gives you, Allah empowers you. And Allah gives barakah in your work, and you'll see the impact far beyond what you could have imagined. And sometimes it happens in your own lifetime, but you don't care. Even if it doesn't happen in your own lifetime, you weren't, that wasn't your problem. If it happens a hundred years after you're gone, you're still happy. 
Because that, you, you didn't want to see the results. You just wanted to work towards them. And that was enough for you. You did not get depressed when you didn't see the results. As a matter of fact, you were only more motivated that there's more work to do. I haven't done enough yet. So you're not even pushing, the difference between number one and impact, the guy who's pushing himself to be number one is only concerned about who? Himself. The person who's pushing themselves for impact, they become number one anyway because their concern is much bigger than themselves. They're thinking about something much, much bigger than themselves. So they keep pushing and they keep pushing and they keep pushing. It, you know, and this is not just limited to Muslims. People like Nelson Mandela is an example of pursuit of impact. He spends a good time in his life, of his life sitting in a jail cell, but he leaves in a, a remarkable impact on the world, on the way the world thinks, you know? And so, from, and by the way, this idea, beyond Ihsan for yourself, after that, this idea of impact is actually very, very fundamental to Islam. The idea of sadaqa jariya, the idea of leaving something good, that is far beyond yourself. The idea of planting a seed in the ground. When a Muslim plants a seed in the ground, they're not waiting for the tree. They're making dua that one day when this tree grows, somebody will sit in its shade, much after I'm gone, and I will get the reward. And somebody else will eat from its fruit, and I'll get the reward. And somebody else will take one of those fruits, take one of those seeds, plant it somewhere else, grow a tree, the process will start over, and I will get the reward. Fi kulli sumbulatin mi'atu sab'at. You know? This is what the, the mind of the Muslim has to become. So now, you students, your mind, I would argue, if you can push yourselves to think, where will I make what? Impact. Where will I make impact? How, what has Allah given me that can make impact? And then, there's the last one. You would think I was done with impact. <laughs> was one last one. There's one last one. And it's hard to understand. But if you are working towards impact, then you have to be, you'll be challenged. And then you'll, be, you'll meet your final challenge. And that is the pursuit of truth. The pursuit of what? Truth. So what happens, for example, I'll give you a practical example. I don't want to talk to you in theory. There was an uh, older fellow I know, I consider him a mentor. Um, this gentleman lives in Pakistan. I haven't been to Pakistan in, a, in many, many years. Last time I was in Pakistan was in 1993. So I haven't been there many, but I know what he does there. So he used to work as a, uh, an executive in a corporation. He was in the marketing department, pretty high caliber executive. And he just felt like he, and he was number one. And he made good money. He made good money and he was number one, but he was unhappy. Now why was he unhappy? Because he felt that his goals are too low. Being number one came easy for him. Making a lot of money came easy for him. That automatically came with a lot of prestige. Family's happy. Everybody thinks he's the coolest because he's the boss in the office. All the steps before, he already has. But he felt like his life is passing by and he's not leaving any what? He's not leaving any impact. So he left his job. The family liked it or didn't like it? The family went crazy. What are you doing? How are we going to make money? If I don't have money, I won't be cool anymore. People are going to think, we lost all of our prestige. You understand what I'm saying? The previous steps start falling apart. Because he doesn't care about any of those, now what does he care about? Impact. So what does he decide to do? He decides to start concerning himself with educating children in villages in Pakistan. And he doesn't just want to teach them tahfeel of Qur'an or Islam. He wants to make them successful citizens in society. So he decides to create programs where these children learn character, giving, uh, they learn English, they learn Arabic, they learn Urdu, they go on to do their bachelor's degrees, and they on to go to master's degrees, they on to go on to do their PhDs, and then when these, and he especially focused a lot on orphans. When he focused on orphans, what happens with orphans? By the time they graduate and they get their PhD, 20 years later, these PhDs, who's, who's their family? They're orphans, right? Who's their family? The orphanage. So when they think about giving to their family, after they've gotten their career, who do they give back to? So he's got these hundreds of orphans that are now professors, some of them professors at Oxford, some of them executive MBA, some of them in Wall Street, in, in America, all over, and all their concern is how to make the village better, right? And that's all he wanted to do, and he's got hundreds of thousands of kids in this program, hundreds of thousands, over the last few years, subhanAllah. 
They started publishing books, like Islamic books and character books. I think they sold 8 million books last year alone. But a combination between sold and gave away. Just gave away. This man's life became not about number one. This man's life became about what? Impact. And you cannot just see start. You know, I can tell you 8 million books or this many schools or this many children. But you know the real impact you can never measure. Because when you change a person's life, there's no gauge, there's no chart that can show you how you've impacted their life, right? But now let's talk about this pursuit of truth. Why did I bring this up? When you pursue impact and you become a big organization, sometimes the government official comes to you or some corrupt you know, businessman comes to you and says, I want to give you money. Do this for my village. I can help you with your work. It's good work. I want to help you. Take my money. What does he have to say? He has to say, no, that's not clean money. I can't take it. Uh, you know, Allah accepts only that which is good and pure. I'm doing this for Allah. I want to leave good impact. I cannot pollute the money that comes into this organization. Now the one that he refused is angry with him. And the one that he refused is making money from haram sources. And when people make money from haram sources, they're not the nicest people. So if you make them angry, basically they become your enemy. And they want to destroy you. And they'll come after you. But you don't care because your only pursuit is the truth. Because when you pursue the truth, you will meet with opposition. You will meet with people that are trying to tear you apart. You will meet with people that will question your intentions. You will meet with you know, resistance. And when it comes, you cannot compromise your principles. You cannot compromise the truth. You have to hold on to it and stand by it. My time's up? Yeah, time's up, I know. Okay, very cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. So, if this is the trajectory, then I would argue for all of you students, especially the students here, you have to think about what your life is going to mean. Don't let it be dictated by other people. I just want to get a job and I'll be happy. If you just want to get a job, your pursuit was money and that's it. Maybe prestige, that's it. You ended on a very low part of the, part of the scale. You want to go higher and higher and higher. And you know what, when I, 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 alhamdulillah, I run a company and I have about almost 50 employees. And now when I interview someone, you know what I'm looking for? Is he pursuing impact or not? Is he pursuing truth or not? I don't care about the resume. I don't care about where you got your degree how much experience you have. I care whether you were trying to, my organization, the work that I do, we concern ourselves with truth and impact. That's what we want. So when I get an employee and he says, so how are the benefits? How often do you get a promotion? What are the vacation times? You know, those are good questions. But if that's all you're asking, I can tell that your pursuit is what? Is money. Oh, I can't wait to be a Bayina teacher. It's gonna be so cool. Uh-oh, you're looking for prestige. You're not a good fit. Somebody says, I don't care if you put me in the basement, you put me in a room that has no windows, I just want to study Quran and be able to give something of benefit. That's all I care about. <gasps> As an impact guy. That's an impact guy. I like this guy. And somebody else tells me, look, I want to work for you, but I disagree with you in this, 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 and this. Oh, I love those people. That's a truth guy. Because they don't care. I, one of the hires I made was so cool, I was interviewing him for a position, and he said, I'm sorry, I can't talk anymore. I was like, what happened? He goes, Asr time, I have to go. And he hung up in the middle of a job interview. That's the reason I hired him. That's why I hired him. Because when it came to that truth, nothing is more important. Nothing is more important. He knows that I am not the provider of risk. Allah is the provider of risk. He's clear about that. Good hire. You're on. You see what I'm saying? So if, if you really want to make impact in life, then inshallah you'll get places. You don't have to impress people. You just have to, you have to impress Allah. You have to impress Allah. So I pray this conversation was of some benefit for, for you. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal makes the youth of especially this place and this country and the youth of the Ummah at large people of impact. And in a way that makes this world a better place. Wallahi the opportunity to do good is endless. We are not living in depressing times, we are living in very optimistic times. 
Opportunities are endless all around us. We just have to seize them. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us from the people who seize those opportunities. Jazakumullahu khairan. Thank you so very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tuanku, patut mohon berkenan dulu-dulu tuanku untuk diteruskan atau cara majlis. Ladies and gentlemen, now we'll open the floor for Q&A session. Okay, don't ask me hard questions, okay? <laughs> Not all at the same time, yes? Great question. So the, I'll repeat the question. Uh, you know, I said that, that we have to concern ourselves with impressing Allah. What is this, the first step in impressing Allah? You know, people assume that making Allah happy well, pleasing Allah is hard. Uh, it's actually little nas gayatun la tudrak. Pleasing people is is impossible. Pleasing Allah is the easiest thing. It's the easiest thing. All He's asking from you is sincerity, genuineness. That's all He's asking. He doesn't ask for much. You know, wa yafu an kathir. He overlooks so much, so much stuff. He doesn't expect you and me to be perfect. He never did. He never did. And I, I, unfortunately, some people describe Islam as something where you, ha you and I have to become perfect. That's not the case. It's also not fair that sometimes when we explain the stories of the Sahaba, ajma'in, when we talk about, for example, giving sadaqah, we give the example of Abu, Abu Bakr or Umar. We start with Umar because he gave how much? Half. And we give, then we give Abu Bakr because he gave what? Everything. And then we say, who's going to give? For the masjid, or who's going to give? The problem is there are not the only two sahaba. There's thousands of sahaba, thousands and thousands of them. And Allah is pleased with all of them or no? But if you only mention two of them, and say Allah is pleased with the two of them, because one gave half and one gave full, you start thinking the only way Allah will be happy with me is if I give half or if I give full. Anything less, I mean, but even at that time, were there Sahaba who gave 1%, 2%, 3%, one gave half a percent? Is, was that the case? Yeah. Yeah. And was Allah happy with them too? وَكُلًّا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْحُسْنَى And every one of them, Allah has promised the best. Every one of them. Even for example, we know that the Muhajirun, the Sabiqun, you know, Sabiqun, أُولَيْكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ The Sabiqun are in a separate category. لا يستوي من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة. The ayah begins by saying the people who spent before victory came are higher rank because when you spend and give after victory that's easier. But then Allah says وكل وعد الله الحسنى and every one of them Allah has promised the best. And why is that important? Because then Allah has opened the door for all the people. I will share with you one, it's a difficult concept, I hope I can make it easy for you on this question, don't take the next question. For a community, the motivation is different. For an individual, the motivation is different. For a community, the principle of our religion is yassiru wa la tu'assiru. For a community, make things easy, don't make things difficult. Allah will be happy with you and it's not hard. That is for who? A community. For an individual who goes higher and higher on the steps I talked about, their standards become higher, yes? So for them, the minimum standard is not enough. They have to push themselves to a higher standard. They will get inspiration from Umar giving half and Abu Bakr giving full. That is not for the community, that is for the individual. 
And some individuals will push themselves harder, and some will push less hard, some will be ahead, some will be behind, and that's okay. The problem is, when the people who are pushing extra look back at everyone else and say, hey, why aren't you people pushing extra? That's not fair. Because now you're taking your personal standards and you are trying to impose them on the community. Allah made ease for the community. There's ease for the community. So we have to understand in the, in the teachings of our deen, sometimes there are things that we talk about to the community, but they're actually motivations for the individual. Yeah. There's a, there's a mic right there. Actually, he's waiting there. He's waiting there. Okay, can I ask first? Sure. All right. Uh, thanks for... Actually, I want to thank you first for the YouTube videos because it inspired, inspires me when I'm brought down sometimes. I have two questions to ask you. Sure. The first question is, uh, I can't get you for, for your talks, actually. The one that you said that uh, someone just, uh, what, uh, just get uh, from his job and go for the dean for, for that. Mm -hmm. So what you are going to, uh, to, 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 to teach us? Actually, so because I'm an engineering background, and uh, I'm raised without a uh, non-religious uh, background, so I'm not a net non uh, uh, speakers for Arabs. So when I, I'm, I'm in solar, I can't understand, and I really don't feel it. Okay. All right. So what is the best advice for you to? Very cool. For, for Thank you for your question. It, it actually helps me complete my thoughts from my talk. Um, so there's a few things I want to tell you guys. The pursuit of money. The pursuit of money, then the pursuit of number one, then the pursuit of impact, remember those things? Let me tell you, the pursuit of money is not a bad thing. The pursuit of money is not a bad thing. The pursuit of money is a good thing so long as you have pursuit of impact. If you don't have pursuit of impact, you're only trying to make money for who? Yourself. By the way, if you want to have impact, don't you need money? You do. You have to have a good business plan you had not just a good business plan, you should have the best business plan. You should have the best career goals. You should try to aspire to do those things because that is necessary for you to be able to have impact. These are things that go hand in hand. Actually, organizationally, your project, your business, they should have a good way of pursuing money. You, personally, should be pursuing impact, right? So you have to balance between those things. They don't go, well, I don't care about money anymore, I only care about impact. That's not how it works. Now, your second question, about you not feeling connected with the prayer uh, is actually a question that is, that is uh, fair and it's applicable to the majority of Muslims in the world. So you're not the minority, you are the majority. The majority of the Muslims in the world, when they pray, they don't know what they're saying. They don't, they're, they, it's very hard for them to be impacted by what they're reciting because they don't understand what they're reciting. And I argue that is not your fault. It's not because you're less of a Muslim or you're not as good as other people or... It's not. Allah put you in a different family situation, a different society, and He put other people in different society. And as a matter of fact, today, nowadays, there are many, many people like you in the Arab world. They're Arab and they don't understand what's happening in Salat. That's happening now. That's a reality too. The question is, what I told you is, these are the problems, but we have to focus our attention on the solutions. We have to focus our attention on the solutions. There is a way to learn Arabic. Uh, there's a way to learn an Ar Arabic for an engineer. Part time. A little bit. Enough in four months, five months, that they can actually understand the Quran. Just half an hour a day, or less. You can do it. If you can learn, people can learn C++. <laughs> if people can learn the language of calculus, which isn't even human, you know, I mean, if you want to, if you don't know what depression feels like, study programming. You miss one slash somewhere, and now you're looking through the code. You know, ah, so painful. Arabic is actually pretty easy. It's actually, and for, well, let me tell you something, let me tell you a secret. Engineering students, science students, for you, Arabic is extra easy. Because Arabic is all math. Arabic is just a mathematical language. 
If you approach it that, that way, that's how I teach it. I teach it as a math class, pretty much. It's just formulas. It's just permutations. And once you learn those, you start understanding it. It's pretty easy. It doesn't take much time. I would theoretically argue if you can give a total of maximum, or okay, minimum 50 hours, maximum 100 hours, you can actually start understanding the Quran without translation to a very good extent. That's not a lot of hours. That's just, it's not a lot of hours. It just, you know, how do you want to pursue it? I, I have put a course together, it's online. You can follow it on your own pace. It's called Arabic with Husna, you should give it a shot. Arabic with Husna. Okay, I taught my daughter, who was 10 years old, who was 10 years old at the time, and she's not a genius, alhamdulillah. So the idea was if I can teach her, anybody can learn. That was the idea. So, and now alhamdulillah, the books have been published too and, and things like that. So you can take advantage of that. It's for self-study. Because I, w I learned Arabic part-time while, uh, uh, while I was in college and I was working full-time. That's when I learned Arabic. So it can be done, inshallah. All right, sorry, sir, before that, uh, you can introduce yourself and maybe you can yes. Thank tell you. your organization. You see, Mr. Norman, we appreciate your comprehensive lecture. You see, we are thankful to you. But we have a few points to point out here, if you don't mind. You see, in the first, you see, part of your lecture, we were giving something importance to the secularism, right? Mm -hmm. And in the second part, sorry, in the second part, again, you have come to the science of God, right? Mostly things you explained, they were depending upon the science of God. Science of God? Yes, science of God. I, what I feel personally as a research scholar, we have two sciences in the world. One is from God's side, one is from the which we have made as a science, right? And I think the science of God is always superior. Right. Now nothing is left in the world which has not been pointed out in Holy Quran. Yes. Right? It is a very comprehensive and holy book, what I feel personally. If you talk about the secularism, right? The first person in the world, he was the prophet who said about the distribution of wealth, your zakat and everything. If we talk about the Marxism, it was very much late, you see. Mm -hmm. The first, you see. The prophet said how the child is born and what the science said about the child, you see, very later, centuries later. If we talk about Islam and science, they knew the first person in the world who made the operation, he was a Muslim, a strong believer of God. Yes. If we talk about mathematics, the first person who discovered the zero for mathematics, he was the Muslim, yes. right? A strong believer of God. Mm -hmm. So now in a right. nutshell, you see, for the young people, if we say that science sorry, is sir, separate... Sorry, we, we, we don't yes, have much sorry, time. Yes, sorry, please. Okay. So, no, okay. All right. Your name again yeah. and your, where you're from? No, yes. I said my name is Muhammad Khan, I'm from Pakistan. Okay. Professor and a research scholar. All right. right. Now please see here, uh, everything what I'm sorry, I was discussing, uh, Prophet said, if you want education, you go and go to China. He did not stop for the modern education also, mm -hmm. right? And he was believing, you see, in all the prophets mostly, Jesus, in Hinduism, everything. He did not refuse. He had the respect for every religion. But if we say to the generation, young generation, that we should believe in the materialistic life, I don't believe it because, you see, the science of God is, is superior. I'm sorry, let me give a short example. Science has developed, but can we produce a drop of blood, you see, for a person who needs, you see, the blood after accident? Answer is no. Who is going to do that? It is the science of God. You see, so science is God is always superior. We may have the materialist life in the modern society to earn the money. And you are talking about peace and something cool, cool, cool. What is that? It is learned. You see, in the Holy Quran, you get the peace of mind when you go for the prayer. The people getting earning billions of dollars. I think I agree with why, you. Yes, sir. Why they go for the prayer in the mosque? Okay. See, because sorry, they get sir, the, sorry, excuse me. We don't they have get, much they, time. They, they, yes, they get the peace of mind. All right. 
So please, I, you and I can talk privately. Yes, science inshallah. of so, God so. is superior okay. than all the things. Okay. I have noted so many points, but I don't want to take your much time. So you I can take believe my time that, after, inshallah, you no see, problem. in the next lecture, if you ask the young generation to believe in both things, God and science. And number two, you said everybody can do everything he, want, he or she wants. I think the answer is no. Why because every, sorry, every country has its own constitution. And they have to work, they have to play the life according right, to sorry, constitution. Sorry, so once again, we don't have they much time. We have the to cut it off. And Thank maybe, you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're right. Thank you, sir. Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank maybe you can meet Ustad right after this. Yeah, yeah sure. All right. Okay, maybe we can have a last question. Only last yeah. question. Assalamu yes. alaikum. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. That was intense. Okay. All right, sorry, sorry for that. Maybe you can ask Ustad later on because we don't have much time. Sorry for that. Oh, okay. okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wahab, medical doctor. Thank you very much. You're an inspiration from Allah. Changed my life. And I just want to know, how can we get more young Muslims to, to get to the mosque? Is it the nature of the khutbah can be changed? Because when we see your khutbah, we get a good crowd. What? All right, this yeah, is the last question. Is okay, audience, the, this is the last question. Maybe we can do that. Oh, no, 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 this is the last question. I'm really sorry for that. There's only one more. One more question, okay. It's just like the photos. <laughs> There's always one more. Okay. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I want yeah. to thank Mr. Noman for giving an enlightened lecture. My question was simple. Uh, in, this, in this modern world, there was a lot of a lot of Muslims, some was a Shia, some was a Mirzani in India and Pakistan, uh -huh. some was a, from Mazhar al Hadith in, in Saudi, uh -huh. some was an Asha'ira. How to unite all the Muslim for, for, for these modern, modern times? Okay, simple question. Yeah, sure, a simple question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, I, I don't know, I think it's too simple. I don't think I need to answer it. Uh, uh, look, when we talk about unity, sometimes we don't, we, 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 we separate um, the practical from the theoretical. Practically speaking, unity, like your unity with someone who lives on the other side of the world is only in your head. The first kind of unity you and I have to think about is the unity with our neighborhood, with the people in our community, with our own family, with our, you know, with the people that you pray together with at Jumu'ah, you know, with your city, within your city. That's the practical manifestation of unity. If all of the Muslims, people argue, Muslims have no unity because we don't pray Eid on the same day. Even if you prayed Eid on the same day, does that mean unity? No. Unity is actually about hearts. It's about praying next to someone and not thinking ill about them. Wanting the best for them. They give other people preference over themselves even if they're starving. That's unity. Now we've made unity into this label and this label and this label and this label and this label. The problem with this whole thing is these differences will have been there for a long time and they're not going away anytime soon. But that does not make me love my Muslim brother any less. That does not make me care about someone who says La ilaha illallah any less. When somebody says Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I love my messenger so much that even if I disagree with this guy in 100 things, the fact that he loves the same messenger وسلم, is enough for me to love him and pray for him. That's enough for me. That should be the, the, the thinking of the Muslim today. Because we, what we've done is, when we think, look at another Muslim, the first thing we think is which school of thought is he? Which brand is he? Is he closer to my Islam or has he got his own Islam? We don't think this is a believer in Allah and this is a loving follower of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa yakfini. That's enough for me. That's enough. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامَ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنًا Quran says this. Don't say about someone who threw salam your way. They threw salam. Look, wallahi, the, the language is so important in the Quran. فَلَمْ يَقُلْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُسَلِّمُ عَلَيْكُمْ don't say about the one who says salam to you that you're not a believer. He didn't say that. He said the one who throws salam your way. You know what that means? They didn't even say it necessarily in a respectful way. Salam alaikum. 
Salam alaikum. <laughs> Anybody who throws, even throws salam your way, you don't get to assume about them that they don't have iman. Lasta mu'minan. Don't say about them you're not a mu'min. In the Quran, saying salam is enough. Saying salam is enough that we are united. Just saying salam. Imagine that. Now, we don't just say salam, we make dua for each other, we hug each other, we talk to each other, we spend time with each other, we still hate each other. And then the Quran is just salam. And by the way, at that time, at that time, we were in a state of war with Makkah. Medina was in a state of war with Makkah. So if a Sahabi is traveling in the desert and some enemy comes, the, the kuffar used to dress the same way and the muslimin used to dress the same way. They didn't have... Like you say, he's wearing a thobe and a turban, he must be a Muslim. No, no, no. The Quraysh wore thobes and turbans too, you understand? So you don't know the guy coming to you is Muslim or mushrik. You don't know. And the mushrik knows that you are Muslim and he wants to kill you. So he just says salam to you. He only says salam to you, so you think you are what? You're safe. And he can come and attack you. So it could be a matter of life and death. In that situation, this could be a matter of life and death. And even then Allah says, if they say salam to you, don't say you're not a believer, I don't trust you. Don't do that. Salam is enough. Allahu Akbar. And now we have suspicion of each other all the time. Oh, the guy was talking about Quran, but I'm not sure if he's really a believer. And this person, I mean, I've seen him pray in the masjid, but I'm not sure about whether they have good Islam or not. We doubt people so easily that the, the, where they stand with Allah is not your business, not my business. Allah made it our business to give benefit of the doubt to the fellow believer. So long as they say salam. So long as they say salam. SubhanAllah. So may Allah Azza wa Jal, that, and that's an easy way to unite. You just have to change the way you think about the Muslims. And uncle, thank you for your comments. We'll talk about them inshallah at the end. About the khutbah, let me tell you just a couple of things. The khutbah is a responsibility of a community. Okay, and it's a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the majority of the khutbahs of the Prophet ﷺ were about the Qur'an. The majority of it was he would he, almost, it would just be ayat of Qur'an. That's, that's what the original sunnah of the khutbah is. And they were very brief, right? But now we're living in a time, if you just recite the Arabic, you won't understand anything. So you have to explain in the language of the people, which is actually, by the way, itself a sunnah. Speaking in the language of the people itself. وَمَا أَرْسَلَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ so explaining things in the language of the people itself is fulfilling a legacy of our Prophet But regardless if the khutbah, let me tell you, if the khutbah is the most boring thing you've ever heard in your life, if you go sit in Jumu'ah and the khatib says, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmadu <laughs> If that happens to you, you still go to the khutbah. You still go to Jumu'ah. Because you're not going to Jumu'ah to get entertained. You're not going to Jumu'ah to hear a good speech. You're going to Jumu'ah because Allah called you, not the khatib. Allah called you to Jumu'ah. And Jumu'ah is a rehearsal of Judgment Day, when we will not have a choice and we will gather. You know, ذَلِكَ يَوْمُ الْجَمْعَ وَهَذَا هُوَ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ That's the day of the gathering, this is the day of Al-Jamr. It's a reminder of Judgment Day every Friday. It's a reminder of Judgment Day. So yes, Alhamdulillah, you get to hear khutbahs or lectures online, the ones you like, the ones you, know, you prefer, etc. Some of them are five minutes or two minutes long, good for you. But that has nothing to do with the khutbah, actually. If you get a khutbah you liked, Alhamdulillah. If you got a khutbah that has nothing to do with what you liked, or you couldn't even understand it, I've attended, I've, I've been here for two months. I've been here, for, I've maybe given khutbah twice. All the other times I've sat in a bahasa khutbah. I mean, I just keep listening for one word, I'm any, I know any. He said, Satu, oh, Satu, I know Satu, okay. <laughs> you know, and then I sat in the Eid Khutbah, the Eid Khutbah, back in America, Eid Khutbah is 10 minutes, over here was one hour. <laughs> you know, but I sat in it, why? And I didn't say, oh, I didn't understand anything. <laughs> I wish they had it in English. No. I didn't go to Khutbah to get entertained or to learn. I went to Khutbah because it's an act of Ibadah. You do it for the sake of Allah. You have to be clear why you do something. So that's, don't mix, you know, going to a convention or a lecture or a program is something else. Going to Jumu'ah is something else. Going to Jumu'ah, the khutbah is part of what? Part of Salah. Part of Salah. Just like you can't make the excuse, I don't know Arabic, that's why I don't pray. 
I'm not entertained by recitation, that's why I don't pray. You can't make that excuse. The same way you cannot make an excuse for skipping Jum'ah or going late to Jum'ah. You know, make, do ihtimam of Jum'ah. Go out of your way to take care of your obligation for the Friday prayer. This is a big thing in Islam. This is a big thing in Islam. One of the worst violations of Bani Israel is they played with the Sabbath. They played with Yom al-Sabt. And Allah took their Sabt away and gave us what? Jum'ah. And if we even do a little bit violation of Jum'ah, it's a very big crime. Because that's very dear to Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay, so that's about Jum'ah. We're done, right? That was the last question? Um, learn- it's close to radio stand. Okay, cool. Yes, I'm really sorry for that. No, I'm not. Uh, don't be sorry. It's all yeah. good. <laughs> maybe the audience can meet you afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. through the Facebook or Twitter. All right. Thank you very much, Ustad. Zakmullah khairan. Salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause to Ustad. I can go up this time. Maybe you're not going to bring me back down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to inform you that uh, the 17th of August 2015 was Ustad Numan Ali Han birthday. And on behalf of the Unimapians and also the police committees, we wish you all the best and for your career and also future. Ladies and gentlemen, as a token of appreciation, we would like to invite Young Brabahagia Datuk Vice 